Ambassador. Administrator Power, thank you for joining us. As we meet today, horrific violence continues to uh, unfold in Khartoum. Hundreds are dead, thousands have been wounded. The staff of humanitarian aid organizations have been assaulted and killed. A reminder of the dangers our diplomats, humanitarian and development workers at USAID face as they carry out their mission every day. I'm sure I speak for all of us when I say how relieved I was to hear about the successful evaluation of our, excuse me, evacuation of our officials from Sudan. But I agree with administration officials, we cannot and must not abandon the Sudanese people. Nor will, we, nor will insecurity deter us from our work in other parts of the continent and other places in the world. Russia's war in Ukraine is driving up food, fertilizer, and energy costs all over the globe. 48 million people in West Africa are experiencing food insecurity. Climate change is fueling record floods around the world from Pakistan to Nigeria and extreme droughts in Brazil and Central Asia. Additionally, the threat of state-sponsored death squads, criminal gangs, and sexual violence is driving millions and millions of people to flee their homes, creating a growing migration crisis across continents and hemispheres. So, Administrator Power, do you think we are prepared? Because while your budget request is an improvement compared to past years, given the challenges and risks we face right now, and the shocks and stresses we will face in the future, I am concerned that this budget is not ambitious enough. Successful U.S. foreign policy requires a balance between the three Ds of defense, diplomacy, and development. Development is effectively the ounce of provision for the pound of cure we see in places like Sudan right now. It cannot be an afterthought for the United States, and it certainly is not an afterthought in Beijing. China is outspending us and outflanking us when it comes to international development and development diplomacy. I would argue American international development is driven by a desire to support people seeking to improve their own lives, to help build strong societal and governance structures that facilitate sustainable economic growth. That stands in stark contrast to China's development approach, which amounts to foreign infrastructure investment, which I think is fair to say, does not come from the goodness of Xi Jinping's heart. Rather, it is a tool Beijing uses effectively to influence and shape the direction of nations around the globe. Their uh, efforts ignore workers' rights, destroy the environment, saddle local communities seeking critical infrastructure projects with faulty bridges and roads. We need to up our game to be responsive to the types of infrastructure projects so many nations need. We can build the world's best hospitals, the smoothest roads, the most efficient power grids. But when the United States invests in local infrastructure, we also have to make sure that the host communities know what we are doing, that they know the United States model of development and investment brings needed, trusted, and sustainable partnerships for growth. I also think that when dem democratic nations try to do the right thing, USAID needs to be able to move quickly. We must be agile and ready to support those democracies facing economic hardship. So I'd like to hear your thoughts on whether USAID has what it needs to show that democracies can deliver for their people. Because oftentimes USAID moves slower than molasses. Case in point, the humanitarian crisis for Armenians in Nagorno-Karabakh is only getting worse. Where are we? Why aren't we airlifting humanitarian supplies to those Armenians facing Baku's blockade? We need to respond to events quickly, and we also need to address root causes. I think you'd agree with me that international development must be about more than sending tents to people impacted by an earthquake or hurricane. It has to be about making strategic investments that address the needs of people on the ground, about strengthening the systems and institutions countries need to be resilient in the future about creating good paying local jobs, and about supporting the peace and prosperity people need to raise a family rather than be forced to flee their homeland. So Administrator Power, I look forward to hearing your testimony, updating us on your progress since the last year. With that, let me turn to the ranking members for some open statement. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, a year ago, we had the same hearing as we do every year, the budget hearing. 
And uh, Ms. Powers, I want to quote you as we start uh, this hearing. You said last year, quote, the work we do abroad matters to Americans here at home. It makes us safer, it makes us more prosperous, and it engenders goodwill that strengthens alliances and global cooperation. Well said. Americans support that proposition, but it must be done well and it must be done right. And in that regard, there are problems with this budget, and uh, I want to talk about them briefly, and we'll uh, drill down as the hearing goes on. For example, the budget correctly identifies China's predatory and coercive activities as a major threat to the U.S., uh, our allies, and our interests. Again, well said. It even includes a number of so-called outcompete uh, China initiatives that I might be willing to support. But the decision to request this as mandatory funding without legally required offsets demonstrates a lack of seriousness, I believe, and an inability to make tough budget, budget decisions. Also, by example, the administration's climate and energy policies are self-defeating and misaligned with out-competing China proposition. By rejecting low-carbon energy options like natural gas and clinging to only green-only approach, the administration will not out-compete China and it will not reduce carbon. Why do I say that? Instead, it will push developing countries toward even more Chinese investment in high-carbon, cheaper energy, while simultaneously creating markets for solar panels built, as we know, on the backs of Uyghur slave labor in China. This is not an appropriate use of U.S. Ta taxpayer dollars. As administrator, you lead a world-class team of humanitarians working to address the highest levels of conflict and displacement in recorded history. Unfortunately, existing humanitarian crises aren't going away, and in places like Sudan are only getting more dangerous, as we all know. Remarkably, with this budget, the administration wants to reduce humanitarian assistance while increasing contributions to a non-transparent green climate fund to $1.6 billion. This makes no sense. Regarding Ukraine, the administration has spoken at length about its unwavering commitment to the Ukrainian people. Yet this budget requests, uh, the, the budget request you have in front of us pretends that the war isn't happening and requests no funds. Uh, we need an explanation of this. Turning to the West Bank and Gaza, the administration restarted Palestinian assistance two years ago, yet we've seen even higher levels of violence. Palestinians are identifying with terror groups to promote their interests more, and the Palestinian Authority's abhorrent pay for slave policy continues unabated. So why is the administration asking for an additional $250 million? Whose interest will be advanced by this money? Certainly not America's interest, and certainly not our uh, ally Israel. I'm also compelled to point out the irony of requesting funds to empower uh, women globally, uh, a, certainly a, a laudable uh, goal, but at the same time requesting flex flexibility to provide assistance to the Taliban, to the Taliban. Uh, did we learn nothing during the 20 years we spent in Afghanistan? The Taliban certainly don't have uh, the same values that we do. Finally, I would be remiss if I did not raise once again the need to make sure that the U.S. follows the do-no-harm principle in response to complex emergencies such as South Sudan and Ethiopia. We all know these are tough, but we still await the conduct, uh, the co uh, conduct of assistance reviews and investigations into humanitarian aid diversions. We need strong oversight on assistance, and uh, these issues need our view. There are a lot of areas in which we can and should work together. For example, I'm eager to help ensure USAID has a workforce that is fit for purpose and fully capable of meeting, meeting today's complex development challenges. This applies not only to the Bureau of Humanitarian Assistance, where needs are particularly acute, but also at overseas missions, particularly in Africa. On balance, this, this budget appears to me to be written to pursue domestic progressive goals rather than meet crucial needs overseas. This, this imbalance makes it really difficult to support. It's clear we've got a very steep hill to climb when it comes to aligning priorities and resources. I hope we can get to a resolution on these and come together. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Rich. With that, let's turn to our witness um, with us to testify on the administration's proposed fiscal year 24 
budget for USAID is the agency's administrator, Samantha Power. Um, obviously, just in the opening statements, you heard a plethora of challenges, uh, both for the agency and the world, uh, and uh, the challenges the agency faces and grows in complexity each and every year. You and the dedicated workforce at USAID have extremely difficult jobs to do. We're grateful for your efforts with that. We'll turn to you for your testimony. Your full statement will be included in the record without objection. We'd ask you to summarize it in about five minutes or so so that we could have members engage in a conversation with you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ranking Member Risch. Thanks to all of you who have joined here today um, uh, and those who will join us subsequently. Um, as you each noted in your opening statements, um, the outbreak of discriminated violence in Sudan has upended hope um, for the democratic transition that millions of Sudanese risk their lives for. Um, it has already claimed hundreds of lives and injured thousands more. But the challenges Sudan faces, it's fair to say, I think are emblematic of a wider story that each of you have alluded to that is unfolding in many uh, parts of the world. After decades of development gains that laid the foundation for an era of relative peace, stability, and prosperity, those gains are now at serious risk. During our lifetimes, the United States has helped accelerate tremendous progress in reducing extreme poverty, in fighting disease, in addressing hunger, in getting kids and girls, as it, especially, to school, fueling democracy's rise. But now many of these trends have moved in reverse. The pandemic decimated health systems, leading to a resurgence in diseases from measles to tuberculosis. It also battered many nations' finances after a decade of heavy borrowing and more recently rising inflation exacerbated by Putin's war, 60% of the world's poorest countries are, are currently at or near debt distress, 60%. And natural disasters, as you noted, are increasing in frequency and intensity, leading to a sharp rise in humanitarian needs. The upshot of it all is stark. Uh, for the first time, since the 1950s, human life expectancy globally is on the decline, while extreme poverty is on the rise. At the same time, democracies everywhere are under attack. Our rivals are using transnational corruption, digital repression, disinformation, and in Ukraine, of course, actual artillery and missile fire to undermine freedom, to elevate autocrats, and to curry favor. It is a daunting list of challenges, and I know some question whether the United States should be taking on these challenges through our development investments, while others wonder whether the scope of the challenges at this stage is simply too great to be able to make a meaningful difference. But the fact is, our national security hinges on this work. Deprivation and indignity abroad, as we well know, can fuel resource competition, political fragility and extremism that endangers us here at home and Americans all around the world. Disease outbreaks can cross oceans and recessions in foreign markets can threaten our own economic growth. And if we don't lead efforts to take on these challenges, it's fair to say the People's Republic of China and Putin are ready to step in, whether through opaque loans on unfavorable terms or with mercenaries in tow. An international order that values democracy and human rights and that respects international borders is not a given. Indeed, authoritarian actors are challenging and aiming to reshape it as we sit here. We have to invest in the stable and humane world that we need. USAID is truly privileged to have a leading role in tackling the most significant challenges of our time in close coordination with our interagency partners, advancing diplomacy and defense. And we are grateful to the American people and to you for giving us the resources to make a major difference. That said, we know that to drive progress on the scale that we need, on the scale this array of challenges that you've alluded to demands, 
we have to bring in other donor countries. We have to bring in the private sector at scale. We have to work with multilateral institutions and harness them in pursuit of our objectives. We have to work with foundations and local organizations in our partner, partner countries. So USAID has laid out a new reform agenda aimed at delivering progress beyond our development programs, beyond the resources that this Congress uh, allocates to us, where we are using our expertise, our convening power, our advocacy, our hustle to draw in others, to leverage more resources, to spark innovation, and to inspire broader movements for change. The Biden-Harris administration's FY 2024 request of $32 billion for USAID's fully and partially managed accounts will allow us to make more of that transformative impact. Alongside our partners, we'll invest in countries experiencing democratic openings, helping them show, as the chairman said, uh, that democracy delivers tangible results for citizens. We'll work with nations to attract private sector investment and drive broadly shared economic growth. We'll support countries that are rebuilding their decimated health systems. And we'll meet growing humanitarian needs, not just with emergency assistance, but with long-term investments in resilience. And crucially, we'll invest in our workforce to carry out this ambitious agenda. Since 2019, our operating expense funds have increased at half the rate that our programming has grown, giving us more to do with fewer people and, and resources. But this budget will help us invest in the people and systems that we need to power an agency that is nimble and that is responsive. We know that with the United States leading the way, the world can drive meaningful progress against our toughest challenges because we have decades of gains in global health, in education, and in prosperity to prove it. It is on us now to resume that progress. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Uh, we'll start a round of uh, five-minute uh, questions. So uh, the administration has sent over an ambitious mandatory spending proposal to outcompete China with line items for the compacts of free association, hard infrastructure spending, equity for the Development Finance Corporation, and the Indo-Pacific strategy. What's UA, uh, USAID's role in the outcompete China proposal? Well, um, we already are making great use of the uh, Countering Chinese Influence Fund. It gives us flexibility to do everything from support an open internet to uh, supporting right to information laws that are being used increasingly around the world to actually pu publish for the first time these opaque contracts that charge these inordinate uh, fees on infrastructure investments. Those contracts, as you know, are famously concealed often from the, the publics in the countries in which this debt is being incurred. Um, I think the entire USAID model stands in contrast, as you noted, I think, at the beginning in helping countries work. But I'm trying to find out, toward, Administrator, what specific, I, I gather yeah. the broad strokes. Is there a specific component of the outcompete China that's been delegated to your agency? Well, I think, I mean, uh, there are a number of subcomponents, let's say, of the outcompete China approach. There, there's the request that Senator Risch alluded to with additional funding to really amp up what that looks like. At present, uh, what USA does is we are off in the ground game for the Development Finance Corporation in identifying, for example, in the Dominican Republic, a country you and I know both, both know well, where um, tenders are, uh, you know, can be put out in a manner that requires open, transparent competition in a manner that would almost necessarily benefit uh, U.S. companies. That's happened in a major port in the Dominican Republic. Uh, we are opening a new um, mission, finally, uh, in Fiji, starting in September. Uh, so that's part of the Pacific Islands amp up uh, that is occurring as part of the Outcompete China program. Um, and happy to get you specifics within the mandatory funding proposal. Yeah, I, I'd, I'd, I would very much appreciate seeing that. Attorney to Sudan, are you making provisions for the safety and security of all USAID employees, including local employees? Um, we are working around the clock um, uh, in pursuit of that objective uh, in a very challenging set of circumstances. Six uh, USAID 
staff were evacuated as part of the evacuation that you mentioned at the outset. Um, four Americans and two third country nationals from Pakistan. They arrived uh, in Washington uh, two days ago. Um, we spoke yesterday to our Sudanese staff. We still have 29 Sudanese staff who are in, uh, in Sudan, 27 of whom are in Khartoum and are basically in most of whom in neighborhoods that are, that are incredibly hard to move around in. We are helping them secure onward uh, uh, destinations in terms of our USAID mission, for example, in Egypt or in Ethiopia, so that if they want to leave the country, they will have some place to work. We have given them advance payments, um, salary increases, those kinds of things. But to be honest, Mr. Chairman, it's extremely difficult to access banks right now because even banking employees can't get to the banks. So it just underscores Again, the irresponsibility and, and recklessness of, of the leader of the SAF and the RSF in, in pursuing this conflict. But we will not rest un, uh, uh, unless and until uh, Please you know, our people are Please keep the committee abreast of where you're at in evacuating uh, USAID employees, assuming they're, they want to leave. And I assume that under the present circumstances, a majority of them would want to leave. But That is the impression we have, for sure. Uh, last year in our hearing with your budget, I raised my concerns about violence Armenians are facing in Nagorno-Karabakh. I appreciate I see $40 million in the budget request in assistance to Europe, Eurasia, and Central Asia funds for Armenia, in part to assist with recovery from the humanitarian impact from recent Azerbaijani assaults on Nagorno-Karabakh. Uh, but I'm concerned that these funds will be split among a number of assistance priorities, and that the assistance won't reach vulnerable Armenian populations in Nagorno-Karabakh. How much of this assistance would go towards meeting the needs of vulnerable communities in Armenia and Nagorno-Karabakh as they uh, recover from Azerbaijani aggression? Um, I don't have that figure off the top of my head, and I, I think everything is very fluid there, especially right, in light you, of developments this week. Would you get that for week. the committee, please? I'd, I'd like as to soon as we that. have it, but again, these are, these are Decisions that are made on a on a weekly basis, on the basis of well, there must the be some concept out of forty million. Well, we've we've conducted two assessment missions to the region to look at the needs specifically in Nagorno Karabakh. To get the assessment, I'd like to see the assessment. Okay. And uh, particularly how you're going to help be able to achieve delivering humanitarian assistance in the Lachin corridor. Lastly. Um, I published a comprehensive plan for securing our borders and managing migration and refugees in the Americas. A plan recognizes the fact that most migrants and refugees on the move in our hemisphere are not seeking to come to our border. There's 20 million people who are displaced in the Southern Hemisphere already throughout countries. Some refugees, some seeking asylum, others are economic uh, refugees. The bottom line is they're all over the hemisphere. Now, unless we work with those countries, uh, to create pathways and stability, uh, there will be 20 million people on the march. And what we are facing at the southern border now will be minor in comparison to what we can. So it seems to me that we have to come with an approach that understands it's a hemispheric challenge, not just simply a, uh, a southern border challenge. When the United Nations uh, Commission uh, for Refugees ultimately says that 20% of the world's refugee problems is in the Western Hemisphere, they only spend 8% of their funds on it. So when Colombia takes in nearly 2 million Venezuelans, something's got to give. And the list goes on and on. Now I know that USAID under your leadership has started to move in the direction to support the integration of displaced populations. Um, but we have to do more to address the migration and refugee crisis, uh, not only from Ukraine and Syria, but also in our own hemisphere. So uh, what can be done to significantly scale up USAID funding for integration initiatives in the hemisphere? And can I get your commitment to work with me in the appropriations process to encourage the establishment of a $300 million integration fund uh, so that we can work towards making sure that we don't have 20 million people on the march? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, let me just say I think the president is broadly aligned with uh, the, the view that you have laid out, and we are surging our support as best we can for integration efforts, including uh, the really incredible effort made by Colombia to integrate more than two million uh, migrants. 
those efforts at integration have a direct effect uh, on, as you said, who comes to the border, who seeks to go further north. And just give you one example, uh, Venezuelan arrivals to the U.S. border nearly doubled after Colombia actually cut off the TPS registration deadline back in May of last year. We see that also displacement um, increase in, inside the hemisphere is increasing at a rate 17 times that, which the rate uh, to the border is, is increasing, which is extraordinary when you think about this, how substantial those fl flows are uh, writ large. So we already do work with the Colombians on TPS and in trying to provide support in the communities that are um, housing uh, Venezuelans who've come in, but we'd be very interested in talking to you about what more we can do for countries all along the route north. Yeah, this, this is a question of stability in the hemisphere, stability for the countries that have shown their willingness to accept uh, refugees, and stability at the southern border of the United States. It should be a, a no-brainer. Uh, Senator Rich. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, on April 6th uh, this year, your agency notified this committee of the discovery of widespread diversion of U.S. branded food aid in uh, Tigray. Uh, the war in northern Ethiopia featured, uh, se uh, featured severely restricted humanitarian access, we understand, and looting of humanitarian warehouses. Since the initial notification from USAID, our committee has not been briefed on the diversion of U.S. food aid in Tigray despite requests. While well, I understand the acute situation in Sudan has captured attention within USAID, we should be able to do multiple things at the same time. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you know that in our oversight capacity, we are deeply troubled when these kinds of things happen, and uh, our constituents are even more deeply troubled. And for those that uh, have reservations about all this stuff, uh, th this uh, gives ammunition. So. Uh, can, can you give us an update on the diversion of the U.S. food aid in, in Ethiopia? Uh, thank you. I absolutely share your outrage and that of your constituents um, at what looks to be fairly substantial uh, diversion of assistance meant for what were uh, people in Tigray who were facing famine, uh, famine conditions. Um, we have uh, dispatched our Deputy Assistant Administrator for Humanitarian Affairs to the region, and uh, he and a, and a team is actively looking into what happened, and we do have some uh, preliminary indications of effectively collusion between parties on both sides, actually, of the conflict. Are, is that team still there, or are they back here? Uh, our Deputy Assistant Administrator, I believe, is back, but the team on the ground working out of our mission in Ethiopia is still, you know, uncovering this, and we've engaged uh, the Ethiopian government as well as the, the Tigrayan authorities. It looks, I mean, there's plenty more to be said when we have the actual uh, uh, facts in, in, in a right position, I think, to convey to you, but it, it looks as though this is something that started in the wake of the cessation of hostilities, so a more recent uh, instance of collusion. Um, we have retrieved you know, much of the assistance that was out uh, on uh, open markets, um, but there's no question, uh, again, that this is outrageous, and above all, the, the, the people in Tigray are the ones uh, to have suffered because they will not have received access to, to food in, in the course of distributions because of this criminal network uh, that was established. Again, it looks like somewhere between uh, November and, and February of this year. Well, uh, we're, we're looking forward to that. And, and I got to tell you, uh, there's going to be a lot of pressure from this committee to uh, see what you're going to do about this. Because this, uh, just saying, well, this happened and we're concerned. And this I, I couldn't idea. agree more. And, and we, we got we to have uh, a, a plan going forward that is... Uh, is is much more reliable than what we've got here. I, I, I want to stress how unusual the circumstance was, but not unique, and so your concerns are very well-founded. But it really was, again, the denial of access for our disaster response team that deprived us of the safeguards and the oversight that we normally have. We did have third-party monitors and others we were relying upon, but obviously we have to look at uh, what amounts to a system failure uh, if, in fact, again, this was allowed to happen at, at, at scale. So we know we, we owe you ample, not only accounting for what has happened, but also uh, some 
uh, institution of additional safeguards that would give you the assurance that you need in light of all of the resources that we're expending globally uh, to try to meet food, food needs? Well, uh, let me turn uh, for a minute to the Palestinian question. You heard my opening statement. Um, I'm, I'm really distressed by the fact that, uh, that we're bumping up money uh, uh, in, in this area. Look, we, we've been at this for decades, and we keep trying to pound a round peg into a square hole. We keep doing the same thing. We keep getting the same results. What's, what's the situation with this, uh, in, well, what I think is a very significant increase uh, in this area in the budget? Um, well, I think that, again, while it's, it, there's no question that development assistance or humanitarian assistance has not brought peace uh, to, to this region, I, I think the individuals who are affected by this programming have uh, felt the impact of this programming over the years. Um, and you know, whether that's those who access education through State Department funding, who would otherwise not have access to schools, whether those who access clean water, and again, some of the sanitation programming we're trying to do would have cross-line benefit uh, as well. Um, civil society programming is about holding also the Palestinian Authority to account um, and, and for there to be more pressure from the outside uh, to improve governance, which I know is something that has concerned you. Um, uh, even career skills training for young people. You know, every one of the 10,000 youth that receive those career skills training has the opportunity potentially to find a career that they would not otherwise have found, which means potentially being less attracted to the path of extremism, which uh, of course there are always people there willing to, trying to exploit a sense of deprivation or grievance. Well, uh, Samantha, I, I, don't, <laughs> I don't disagree with what you've said about the, the money doing some good. The problem I've got is this isn't our responsibility. This is not the responsibility of the American people. Certainly, uh, we do our best to try to get people up on their feet and going, but when you get a situation like this that's not only gone on for decades, it's gone on for generations. And we do the same thing over and over and over again. They do the same thing over and over again. And I'm, I'm just disgusted with it and, uh, and, uh, and through with it, to be honest with you. And yet here, uh, there's another 250 uh, million going in. It's just, I, I, I have real difficulty with this, real difficulty. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Cardin. Mr. Power, welcome. Uh, I uh, want to associate myself with the chairman's comments. We're glad to see your budget's moving in the right direction. I don't believe there's enough being requested to meet the needs that are out there. I know I'm joined by other members of our committee. Senator Coons raises this issue frequently in his role on the Appropriations Committee on the challenges that he has on the allocation of the funds. But let me start with the proposal that's coming out of the House Republicans that, as I understand it, would mean about a 45 percent cut in the foreign aid budget. What impact would that have on your ability to carry out your mission, recognizing, as you said, you're looking for partnerships? Can you sustain a 45 percent cut and America still be able to maintain its international presence? I mean, um, where to start? I, I think. I testified last week, and the number that was floating around was a 22% cut, and so that was 13 million children who would not receive vaccinations with a 22% cut, so presuming one would double that, that would be 26 million uh, kids without vaccinations. I think, again, at the same time that we see these proposals for these really substantial cuts, we see very strong demand signals up here from both parties, rightly, uh, for uh, the United States to be out there competing with the PRC, supporting democracy, fighting corruption, um, securing stable uh, investment climates for American companies, um, showing, again, the contrast between the U.S. approach, pursuing an open, free internet, uh, supporting civil society on the one hand, uh, it, again, in contrast with the more extractive approach uh, that, that the PRC is, has taken in its de development objectives. Um, in terms of humanitarian assistance, I mean, you have 230 million uh, people facing acute food insecurity right now. If you were to cut half uh, of, of what we did this year, the United States is the leading humanitarian donor in Afghanistan, in Somalia, in Ethiopia. 
um, uh, if, if you imagine what Ukraine would look like without uh, the support that we've been providing. I mean, Putin could win the war without having to fire a bullet if the Ukrainian government collapsed. And I'm sure you go on and on and on. I, I could. I, I knew the answer to the question, obviously. We've traveled to many places in the world, and we visit with the USAID people, and they all are uh, in need of additional resources in order to match the activities that are occurring in China uh, globally, as well as the needs that are out there to promote American national security. So uh, we recognize that would devastate your program. I want to raise one issue where I'm disappointed you're not seeking more funds, and that's in localization. When you look at the success of PEPFAR, it's not only in dealing with, US, uh, with AIDS, uh, HIV AIDS, it's also local capacity to, to develop a health care uh, infrastructure that can deal with pandemics or other types of challenges. You have a goal of 25% on uh, local aid uh, by, I think, 2025. If you look at the direct appropriations of your budget, it's actually a cut of close to 50%. You have other areas for local partnerships that could make up for some of those funds. Tell me how this budget will allow you to reach your goal of 25%. Well, let me just um, acknowledge the degree of difficulty in, in meeting that goal. We, uh, in, the, in the last year, have increased foreign assistance to local partners from what looks like it was around 7% to probably 10.5%, and that's with a concerted push that not only includes dedicated resources like Central American Local, uh, but also intensifying staff attention because to partner with a local organization given the complexity of compl compliance requirements in working you know, to be good stewards of taxpayer resources requires much more staff focus, left seat, right seat, with a local organization. Um, so I would look both at the budget request for our seriousness of purpose here, but also at the efforts we are making to reduce bureaucratic burdens on staff and if you could look as well at our operating expense requests as we seek to increase the number of foreign service officers, civil service officers, and foreign service yeah. nationals who will help us actually work with those local organizations so they can compete with much larger established I appreciate groups. that, and I hope that you would keep us uh, informed. We want to meet, meet you to meet that 25% goal, so we're interested in helping you. One last question, if I might, and we, we talked about Sudan. Let me talk about Haiti for one moment. We, we know the chaos of, I shouldn't say chaos, the safety issues in Haiti itself. Are we able to provide humanitarian help to the people of Haiti, considering the challenges we have with safety uh, in the country itself? We are providing humanitarian assistance, but access to neighborhoods that even a year ago was relatively smooth is now severely impeded, and, and there's no substitute, again, for, for marrying access and assistance. We have substantial assistance. The UN is issuing its largest appeal since the earthquake in terms of humanitarian needs. But whole parts of Port-au-Prince, neighborhoods you've probably visited, I visited, are now off limits for humanitarian actors because of the prevalence of the gangs. And so, again, humanitarian without security, uh, you know, inevitably is going to limit access, and, and it's only the Haitian people who suffer. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Paul. Ms. Powers, uh, did USAID fund coronavirus research in Wuhan, China? We did not fund gain of function research, as you know. That's not the question. You know. The question is, did you fund coronavirus research in Wuhan, China? Before my time, there was the PREDICT program with which you're familiar, which ended in China in 2019. Yeah, this is a $200 million program, and the GAO has also identified that some of these grants went directly to the Wuhan Institute of Virology, where there is a suspicion that the lab leak began, that began the pandemic. Um, has USAID awarded funds to the Academy of Military Medical Sciences in China? I, not to my knowledge, but I'd have to give I think the answer is once again yes. GAO has found that there have been subawards of NIH money as probably as well as USAID money that went to the Academy of not just medical research, military medical research in China. Now, part of the unknowns here is we can't get the records to look at this. 
So I've been asking for months and months for records. In September of last year, I wrote Ms. Powers, the USAID, a request asking for records from the PREDICT program. These are not classified. These are simply records of scientific research, and we want to read the grants to find out what they were doing and whether the research was dangerous or not. Um, the response I got from your agency was, USAID will not be providing any documents at this time. They're just unwilling to give documents on scientific grant proposal. We're paying for it. They're asking for $745 million more in money, and we get no response. So two weeks ago, the ranking member, uh, Rish, myself, and 25 other Republican senators, unfortunately, so far, signed a letter once again. They've, it's still no response. We're not asking for classified information. We're not asking for anything unusual. Um, 20 million people died around the world. You're supposed to be an agency that cares about the death of people around the world. We, you know, talk about starvation and famine, and 20 million people died from a virus, and you won't give us the basic information about what grants you're funding around the world and who you're funding. Should we be funding the Academy of Military Medical Research in China? They're now off limits. But did we fund them? And who was making the decision? You know who ran the PREDICT program? UC Davis. Have you had any conversations with UC Davis about research in China and whether it was advisable? So again, to set the record straight, first of all, the PREDICT program ended in 2019. Um, we have people- And yet it goes on in other forums and other names. That, that's certainly well, not USAID program. Well, you have, go, you have go, a program go, called or, Emergency Pandemic Threats Program still, don't you? If I could just, just finish in response to the first set of allegations, um, we have provided hundreds and hundreds of pages of documents related to the PREDICT program for the very reason that you say, because we are in- Not to us. We are, again, as I know you had an exchange with Secretary Blinken as well, consistent with longstanding practice. Not going to give them to us. responsive to the committees of jurisdiction. Not going to, you've been consistent in not giving us any information. That's not true. But what we, you're we've saying provided is hundreds of pages in response to, to the current ranking to, to the Senate, Homeland Security, and Government Affairs Committee. For example, we've had extensive. We've been requesting this and gotten none committee. of it. I'm on that committee as well. The thing is, is what we get from you and from the State Department at large is that if Senator Menendez signs it, you'll give us documents. Until then, you'll give us nothing. And we have gotten nothing, zero. You said, we'll not be providing any documents. I now have 25 senators have sent you a letter, and you aren't responding. Well, and we, we don't, we want, we want to see the scientific grants. We give you the money, the taxpayers well, give you the money. We deserve to know where the money went, whether it happened. Look, you're right, it, ha it ended in 2019. When did the virus come about? In about 2019. Some of the research proposals that came about in 2018 were Wuhan Institute of Virology asking for money to create a virus with a furin cleavage site in it, a coronavirus, a SARS-like virus with a furin cleavage site. That's exactly what COVID turned out to be. They wanted money to create such a virus. So we wanna know, are there other research proposals that you either granted or denied that were on the same veins of creating viruses that could have become COVID-19? We can't tell because you won't give us the information. Again, we, we consistent with longstanding practice. We are providing extensive documentation. We have a whole That's team just of people not who do true. nothing other That's than look just back not and true. predict. That is not it true. It is factually accurate. That is it not is. true. Everything we have asked, we have not gotten. I have not seen one document on the PREDICT program. I understand that, again, consistent with common practice Consistent that you're not going to give it to any senator. No, no, no. We're that. providing... Uh, all of the kinds of documentation that you're <laughs> you describing. You are not. You're we being are. dishonest. We, you're being no, dishonest. I'm not. I'm we haven't gotten not. one scrap of paper from you. There, not there, one again, scrap of paper. With the committees of jurisdiction, we are providing all of the paperwork that you are not. requested by the I'm on the other committee. I'm the ranking member on well, the other committee, and I haven't seen a scrap of paper from that committee either. Well, that is. I, that, See, here's what the I, American I can people. The American Actually, people, I can't tell you what the happens American at the committee. The American people think this that because you won't respond, because you respond with a non-response, that you have something to hide. 
I don't know if you have anything to hide or not. I want to see every grant proposal that had to do with coronaviruses that went to China from the U.S. government, from all facets of the U.S. government, and every bit of the Biden administration is stonewalling us and will not give us the information. It makes us think and makes us suspicious that you're hiding something. And it wasn't even you. This was the previous administration. We go back two or three administrations. We just want to see the information, and yet you sit there and you say we will do something, we are doing something, which is absolutely the opposite of the truth. You are not being honest. Senator Coons. Thank you, Chairman Menendez, uh, Ranking Member Rish, and thank you, Administrator Power, uh, for your testimony today. Uh, know that we are uh, following closely developments in Sudan and care deeply about the security and safety of the development professionals uh, who are there and about the restoration, hopefully, of stability uh, and of your mission going forward. Administrator? Hi. Um, if I could, I'd like to continue a conversation we were having at the State and Foreign Operations Appropriations Subcommittee hearing uh, recently about resiliency and about how um, we can and should work together to address food security and food resiliency. Um, the Feed the Future program, uh, now uh, expanded from 12 to 20 countries, is a critical part of the long-term strategy of this administration and previous administrations to invest in uh, systems transformation and resiliency. Uh, Chairman Menendez, in his uh, opening remarks, talked about the critical need to invest in systems transformation. Uh, I'd be interested in um, hearing more from you about what you think uh, Feed the Future is doing or could do to be more effective at systems transformation. In the last year, partly through supplementals, we invested a huge amount in humanitarian relief. In this year's budget request, you request a modest increase in humanitarian relief, and there is a significant need for long-term systems transformation. So uh, I'd love to focus for a moment uh, on Feed the Future and where you see it going and how we might work together to strengthen it as a agriculture transformation program. Then I'd also welcome any advice you have or input because this is the Farm Bill year on the challenges and opportunities you have as an agency in administering uh, Food for Peace, one of the critical Title II programs um, in, uh, in the Farm Bill. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Senator. Um, so let me just um, actually echo something that, that uh, Ranking Member Rich said at the beginning, which is um, a friendly amendment to what you've said, which is that actually compared to the $11.9 billion in humanitarian assistance we provided this year, this coming year, even though the needs, as we know from Sudan, from the earthquake in Syria and, and, and uh, in Turkey, uh, the needs are going up and up and up. Six straight uh, season, uh, failed rainy season in the Horn of Africa. Uh, we are actually coming in with a base request, right, which even if properly funded, yes. would be only half of what we had last year, despite the needs being up probably like close, close to 30%, and we don't even know what Sudan uh, holds in store for us. Um, on Feed the Future specifically, which is a, which is a great great program um, and a great question, you know, we have been um, operating with multiple lines of effort. I mean, part of the idea is to ensure that we have the research into heat-resistant, drought-resistant, pest-resistant seeds, the kind of cutting-edge research that American farmers are drawing from, Sometimes, actually, the research out of Feed the Future labs can benefit American farmers because the discoveries um, can happen anywhere on the earth. Um, and then getting those discoveries, those innovations, into the bloodstream of the places in which we have Feed the Future uh, programs. Um, most of those are uh, in sub-Saharan Africa. We increased the number of target countries this year. Uh, but to be honest, Senator, we were able uh, to match the selection of new target countries in Feed the Future with additional resources by virtue of the Ukraine supplementals and the recognition that Putin's war was having a catastrophic effect on farmers in Africa and beyond right. uh, because of fertilizer prices. So fuel this prices, is an area of particular like interest to me, um, especially given recent indications the Russians are once again threatening to not extend the grain deal given the way we've seen destabilization, um, steady increases in the costs of inputs like fertilizer and fuel. Um, and the real risk um, that there will be broad-scale hunger. Um, let me briefly reference two other things since we're almost out of time. 
Um, one is the Global Fragility Act. Uh, as you know, a law that Senator Graham and I worked on hard over a number of years, signed into law by the previous administration, now more than three years in effect. Um, I am following closely and very interested in its actual implementation, in particular in Global West Africa and in Mozambique. Uh, Rob Jenkins um, from the Conflict Prevention and Stabilization Bureau led a very uh, capable and engaged team from USAID in a conversation I had yesterday with state, DOD, AID about sort of where are we really going in implementation. Um, I, I want to know that I can count on your uh, active engagement and support for this, not just as a new funding stream, but as a new approach to bringing development, defense, and diplomacy into common alignment in areas that are uh, genuinely fragile. Is that your view of this law and its path forward? Yeah, it absolutely is, and I think has already had the desired approach. Um, I know we haven't uh, moved out with implementation as quickly as, as uh, you would have liked or, or circumstances on the ground would, would certainly have benefited from, but I think we now have all the agencies of the U.S. government aligned, and frankly, the, the list of countries that have been chosen are those that would not otherwise necessarily generate a lot of high-level governmental attention. Some Correct. of those countries have been neglected over the years um, in terms of interagency focus and push, and the GFA provides a framework uh, to ensure that doesn't happen, including in Papua New Guinea, which is also overlaps with our broader effort to uh, invest in the Pacific Islands uh, in new ways. A last question, if I might, about economic growth. We've also discussed this at a time when um, the debt burden, as you mentioned in your opening testimony, uh, for so many countries in the global south, so many developing countries has become uh, overwhelming. Uh, and so many countries are asking for our help with economic growth assistance. Um, where does USAID fit into the challenge of providing critical resources, advice, support for economic growth? And where could we help by providing you uh, more tools and more capacity uh, for that engagement with our development partners? Well, I'm sure, Senator, you know this statistic, but I, I have to repeat it because it's so staggering that African countries will spend $70 billion in debt servicing payments in 2023. That is more than the entire total of development aid that, they, that will flow to those countries. Um, we, I think USAID has a critical role. We're the ground game for American foreign policy. Uh, our teams on the ground have economists, have the technical expertise, can find the implementing partners that could offer uh, again, the kind of technical counsel needed to go into these debt restructuring talks uh, with private creditors as well as with the PRC, who are the largest uh, public holder of, of debt. Um, but as you know, we are a very earmarked uh, agency. Many of the, all of the earmarks are very worthy in, in, in areas that you and I both care an awful lot about and that the American people want to see us active in. But the result of that is that, that while everybody would be for US, I think, U.S. aid stepping into this role when these countries are facing such debt crisis, recognizing that debt impedes education, health, uh, governance, you know, every other sector that we work in, uh, the, the very limited amount of discretionary funding that U.S. aid has on offer means that that kind of work gets crowded out again by these very substantial Thank you, Administrator. Remarks. I look forward to working with you to deliver the kind of flexibility uh, that uh, you believe the, the agency both needs and deserves in order to accomplish these complex goals um, in coordination with this committee. Thank you, Administrator Power. Senator Menendez is called to another hearing, so I will continue. Um, last week at the Appropriations Committee budget hearing, um, I talked about a recent trip that I made to Latin America, and we discussed some of the work that USAID is doing in the region to counter um, efforts by the PRC and China. Um, part of our trip was specifically to assess what the PRC is doing in Latin America. And just to follow up on Senator Cardin's question about what the impact of the cuts that are being proposed by the um, House majority would have on USAID's ability to counter Chinese investments in Latin America. Can you talk specifically about what the impact of that might be in a region where we have a lot of work to do at the outset to catch up with the kind of investments that China has been making? Well, let me give you a, a, a couple examples, and, and thank you for your trip to the region and for engaging on this. I'd say, you know, one of the demand signals that we've heard from Congress across both parties is why aren't we doing more in the Caribbean? 
given the acute development needs, given the income inequality, and given the PRC investments that are being made. USAID is working with many up here to substantially increase our work with Caribbean countries who face these big uh, development barriers. That would be impossible if we're talking about cutting back from what we're doing now, never mind not, not meeting the President's budget request, but actually going back uh, to earlier levels. That kind of work would not be possible. So we would not even be present in the way we need to be to be competing. I think also a lot of the countries in the region are suffering, and, and this affects Americans who, uh, who work and, and travel in the region as well, uh, cyber attacks um, and intellectual property theft and uh, you know, uh, crimes of that, of that nature. We are working with many of the countries in the region to help them uh, strengthen their cybersecurity uh, safeguards. And then you know, we talk a lot about the two different governance models, a democratic, transparent, civil society um, uh, empowerment model on the one hand and then a more top-down uh, authoritarian or autocratic model. You know, a lot of the work that we do in the hemisphere is about strengthening democracy and the trend lines are not good at all. So whether it's supporting countries that are moving out on anti-corruption reforms, for example, the Dominican Republic, and trying to ensure that there is a dividend on democratic reform, uh, or whether it is supporting independent media, civil society, and others who are holding governments that are backsliding accountable, a lot of that work would fall away uh, in the face of, of, of those uh, cuts. Um, I think I, I gave you the poll as well that PRC standing is falling and has fallen substantially in just the last few years in the hemisphere. So to miss a moment of opportunity and to actually dial back rather than dial up against that backdrop would be uh, a travesty. Well, thank you. I, I hope that message will be heard. Um, one of the countries where there is that internal battle going on between autocracy and democracy is the country of Georgia, where it's very clear that the people of Georgia want to um, look west to Europe. They want a democracy. Um, Senator Risch and I were there in 2012 to observe the elections when Georgian Dream took over in that country. And um, what we have seen is the government of Georgia um, move increasingly towards autocracy. Uh, one of the, the defining opportunities will be the upcoming elections in 2024. And we will have a critical role in supporting those um, elections and hopefully encouraging an election observer mission. Can, can you talk about how important that will be and whether USAID is um, proposing to be engaged in a long-term election observation mission to support Georgia? Um, I, I don't have the specifics yet of what that program is going to look like, but I wholeheartedly agree with you that the attacks on civil society, some of the laws that have been introduced of late, extremely troubling. Uh, the, on the other hand, the pushback shows the strength of civil society and the citizen power in Georgia uh, to chart uh, its own course or, or to fulfill its own uh, democratic uh, aspirations. Um, but I think, to your point, we broadly need to be targeting resources toward election integrity, knowing that this is the next real opportunity for the citizens to be heard from. And I think that, in all likelihood, will include short-term observation and long-term at the same time. You need the both. Uh, well, I, I think this committee would be very supportive of that, and I would hope that if you need additional funding in order to engage in that kind of a long-term mission, that you will let the committee know so that we can ensure that those funds are available. Um, my final question has to do with girls' education, um, because as we know in countries around the world, uh, girls, particularly when they get to the secondary education level, are much more likely to be out of school than boys for a variety of reasons, um, particularly in conflict countries. And so can you talk about why it's important for us to ensure that adolescent girls have access to education? And we have a global strategy to empower adolescent girls um, to address barriers that girls face. Can you talk about USAID's um, engagement on updating that plan? Uh, thank you again wholeheartedly. Um, embrace the the premise, 
would just say um, our, you know, our investments in basic education um, uh, alongside our commitment to double our gender attribution funding this year or, you know, our programs that, that have gender components, I think create a great opportunity because um, we are looking across all of our programming, across all sectors to look to see where we can, uh, you know, make sure that, that women and girls are, again, a particular area of focus or a kind of design feature of our programming, recognizing how many more barriers they have to continuing education, particularly, as you say, at the adolescent level. So um, I can get back to you on when that strategy will be uh, revised, but just please know that I and our gender coordinator, Jamil Biglio, who I think you know, um, are, are looking to work across our education portfolio to make sure that in the wake of COVID especially, where so many girls have been left behind, that we are going out of our way to try to um, bring girls back to school and, and um, help ensure that the development environment uh, that includes not only education programming, but more broadly barriers in health, barriers in governance, social norms, et cetera, what, what those things are as well as part of that ecosystem can be a major factor in holding them back. So thinking about it more comprehensively. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. And, and um, for the benefit of anybody who may be watching, I think the important thing to remind everyone of is that when, when we empower women and girls in societies, we have more stable societies. They can give back more consistently to their communities and to their families and to their countries than men do. And so this is a very important foreign policy initiative that we need to stay focused on. Thank you, Administrator. Senator Kane. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thanks to the Administrator for all your good work. I want to follow up just really on two items. One, to Senator Paul's point, just to give it some context, nothing is more frustrating uh, than to be a U.S. Senator and to ha request information about a committee that you sit on and to not be given the information. Um, and I had that experience in the previous administration, making multiple requests for information and wouldn't get anything. And, and I will give the ranking member, uh, who was then chair at that time, some uh, thanks, because he would eventually uh, go to bat for me so I could get information I needed, but it, but it shouldn't require that. Um, you, you talked about you, you're trying to respond, and I know the requests from 535 members can be voluminous, but you're trying to respond consistent with previous practice. Let me ask about that practice. Is there anything within the USAID budget that is not within the jurisdiction of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee? Uh, no. Okay, so any questions about um, USAID uh, projects, funding, et cetera, are all within the ambit of the SFRC, there may be overlapping jurisdictions, there occasionally are, but I don't think there's anything within the SFRC space that's not within the jurisdiction. I'm sorry, within the USAID space that's not within our jurisdiction. Is that your understanding? Yes. Okay. And then the second thing is uh, pr uh, consistent with previous practice. Different administrations have, have been different on this practice. Um, does a records request from a committee member have to be sort of validated by the chair of the committee for you to believe that you have an obligation to respond? I, I can check with, with our general counsel, but just let, my understanding is that the chair and ranking, when requests from the Committee of Jurisdiction come in, then we are uh, absolutely responsive. And again, right. have been responsive on COVID origins right. uh, and on the PREDICT program from the- I, I, may want, I may want to follow up on that because if, if a request from a committee member who is voting on the, the USAID budget who is considering an authorizing bill, if that's not enough, and if there needs to be a sign off by the chair and ranking, that really disempowers committee members. And I'm not saying that about this committee, but it could be the, I, I certainly know other committees requiring the sign off of both the chair and the ranking would lead to highly, a high level of inequality in terms of who is able to get information about the jobs that they do. So I, I may want to follow up on what that uh, practice is, but I, but I hope, we may assist Senator Paul in, in getting answers to the questions that he's posed, particularly given your statement that the programs he's asking about terminate in 2019. It would seem like members should get that information and there shouldn't be a reluctance to produce it. Second, um, be a problem solver with me because you have such a breadth of experience and, and I'm thinking about your UN role in addition to your USAID role. 
I was in Latin America recently as well and visiting nations that have some really strong ties to the U.S., like Ecuador, um, in the past six months. Um, Ecuador, Chile, growing ties. Um, Uruguay, strong ties. Dominican Republic, Costa Rica, Panama. And you're under some restrictions that we put on you about the degree to which USAID can provide support in nations once they pass a certain income threshold. And that's not your restriction, that's Congress's restriction. But what we hear from some of these nations is, hey, we're the ones doing things right. And the fact that we may have passed an income restriction doesn't mean there aren't you know, impacted areas that are either incredibly isolated or where the poverty is intense. And when we pass an income level and then suddenly USAID can't be a partner, it's, it's not like China says, oh, your, um, your median income is so high that we won't partner with you. So I know this is not your challenge, it's ours, but what can we do to, to partner better with the nations of the Americas that are doing things right, but that may, in doing things right, have exceeded some of the limitations that then put restraints on the services that USAID can offer? Thank you. Um, well, first of all, again, in, in a resource-constrained environment every day, regardless of the restrictions, we'd be making choices. Um, and some of those choices would be on vulnerability grounds. As you said, there are countries that are doing very well, but communities, for example, in Panama, look at the Darien Gap and the communities along uh, the path that so many are taking uh, north. I was just in Panama uh, as part of a U.S. delegation negotiating around some border enforcement questions. And this was the very question posed to me by the Panamanian uh, leadership to me and, and my colleagues, which is, you know, you want us to do integration along the lines of what the chairman and I were, were talking about earlier of migrants who are passing through, but we don't have the additional resources to do that. It's politically, you know, uh, a contentious issue at the very least, even if it ends up being an economically beneficial one over time. What about you know, helping us in this part of Panama, even if your mission uh, closed, you know, X number of years ago. And, um, and we do some programming through regional programming if there's some cross-border uh, impact. So, of course, more flexibility is only to the good for any administration trying to be nimble in a world of complex challenges. At the same time, we do have to look at other major players in the development space. For example, I think the evolution conversation about multilateral development bank reform really speaks to your question because that is about looking at places that either uh, countries where the World Bank would itself not be able to operate generally because it had also achieved a certain uh, income status and yet maybe actually um, you know putting out a share of emissions that are contributing to the ravaging of Caribbean countries that are you know low income countries and so there are global public goods that we have an interest in advancing or protecting, and that might require also investments. And so that's part of the conversation about the MDB. I take really seriously, and Senator Coons and I have talked about this an awful lot, but our role at USAID is being vice chair of the DFC board. And there again, it's, it's a mix, because we want the DFC to do much more in you know, uh, poor countries and developing countries. Um, and, and be able to absorb you know, more risk to operating in those kinds of difficult environments. But at the same time, we want the DFC, particularly as we talk about infrastructure projects and big investments like that, um, to be operating in places maybe where, where again, they, there might be some temptation to foreclose uh, their, their involvement. So I think the more expansive, the more flexible, and then leaving it to the judgment about how then to make really hard choices about where you would dedicate your resources, because the more flexibilities we have, the more competition right. there will be, of course, for those resources. Tough, tough challenges. I'm over my time. I yield back. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Senator Van Hollen. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Madam Administrator, great to see you. I understand that uh, the Chairman and Senator Coons have, have raised some of the issues surrounding Sudan. Um, I'm really glad to see that uh, our folks at the State Department, including the AID contingent, in Sudan uh, have been successfully evacuated. Look forward to working with you on, on next steps uh, going forward. Uh, Senator Coons and I took a trip there back in May 2021, and uh, it was a time of, of hope, uh, but it was also a time that you could see what's playing out now. Um, all the ingredients were there, and I do think we have to look back to see what we might have done differently in the meantime. Obviously, 
much of it beyond our, our control. Uh, let, me, uh, let me turn to the if issue of um, infrastructure. Um, I, I've been a supporter of the President's um, announcement at the G7 on the Partnership for Global Infrastructure and Investment. Uh, I think that that's a really important element uh, of our overseas strategy, um, including countering China's efforts to export its authoritarian model in many countries uh, through infrastructure projects. Now, we have a lot to offer, and AID uh, provides all sorts of important programs, healthcare, education, things that I think are vital and also can win the hearts and minds of uh, people around the world. But I also think that we need to be competing in the areas of infrastructure uh, because this is the primary tool that China uses uh, to try to export uh, its influence. So I see in the budget uh, you also have $4 billion over five years in mandatory funding to, quote, create a new international infrastructure fund which will outcompete China by providing a credible, reliable alternative to PRC options and make game-changing investments in the Indo-Pacific to strengthen partner economies. Having just returned from a trip to that region with Senator Merkley, um, including stops in Vietnam and Indonesia, I think this is really important. Can you, can you talk a little bit about the relationship between this program that you're discussing, this budget, and the President's Partnership for Global Infrastructure and Investment? Well, it, it's a, you know, one would want to almost go country by country uh, to talk about the different ways that USAID would plug in. Um, but, you know, one of the, the aspects of USAID's governance work that we do, and, and back, I had an exchange with Senator Coons as well about our desire to do more in the realm uh, of um, economic development, of economic governance in these countries. But, what where USAID sort of niche is against a backdrop again of huge resources coming in to do the infrastructure uh, investments themselves, whether from the MDBs or from the DFC or from whomever. But our niche is on standards. You know, it's on uh, what the enabling environment actually is for those investments to be made. It's on the transparency of procurement. You know, working with a country on a procurement law. If you're going to do the big infrastructure, well, that's a recipe for. Uh, potentially, you know, some it could be a recipe in some of the countries in which we work for, um, you know, some problematic um, uh, pilfering by, by by various players. Well, that can't happen. You know, this has to be. Um, we have to be stewards uh, of uh, taxpayer investments in infrastructure as well. So, um, you know, we. I think that our work with non-governmental actors as well. Uh, to ensure, for example, environmental advocates, environmental actors, institutions on the ground, to make sure that the infrastructure investments we make are, are not extractive um, in, in their nature, that they respect labor rights, that there's accountability, again, for how these projects are conducted. That would, again, be in marked contrast with the way some of those projects were done um, through the Belt and Road Initiative. So, I, I appreciate that. Um, Maybe, maybe, and I realize that AID only has a part of this overall A small, effort. small so, part, So maybe yeah. if someone could get back to me just on the relationship between these two funds, what AID's portion is, that would be, that'd be helpful for me. But I appreciate the role AID plays in addressing exactly the kind of governance issues uh, you raised. If I could quickly ask you about the uh, request for uh, ESF funds uh, for Syria, northeastern Syria. I understand AID has a, a piece of this as well. Um, I think that assistance has been very important in a area that is, um, you know, vital. Uh, obviously, been impacted by earthquakes, but also uh, by uh, all the other fighting going on. Could you talk briefly about that money and and its purpose? Great. Well, just to distinguish the humanitarian assistance that we. Uh, are also seeking the broad humanitarian assistance budget of which a large share uh, would go to Syria and to Syrian refugees in Jordan, Turkey, uh, Lebanon, and elsewhere. Um, the ESF, I think, you know, first of all, we do not do stabilization work in regime-held territories. Um, we, uh, we are looking a lot at the Al-Hal challenge. 
uh, which I know many up here are very interested in. Um, uh, you have, um, you know, about 18,000 of the people in that facility are Syrian, but to simply, you know, given given the the backgrounds of many of them, the also the 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 um, what actually has gone on in Al Hall, uh, you know, the, the question of reintegration is very complicated. And so part of our request this year is also looking at not only support for their reintegration into communities, but also uh, the communities to which they are returning um, to make sure that those communities are seen to benefit because there's a lot of stigma and desire not, in fact, to welcome people back. Um, I think generally we also still are looking at accountability for atrocities, you know, if there are stopgap ceasefires on the ground, how to be nimble in coming in support of those ceasefires. Um, and, you know, ultimately, even though it feels very elusive right now, you know, still looking um, through our development resources to look as if there's any way to support political resolution more broadly. But again, that feels very far afield at the moment. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Senator Duckworth. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Administrator Power, for being here today. You know, there, we, we have no shortage of crises that we could talk about in the world today, from Ukraine to Sudan to Haiti, from migration to public health and climate change. Um, I think the news media tends to focus relentlessly on our response to these crises. They do pay significantly less attention to the work of our government, USAID in particular. Um, to address the problems around the world before they become crises. I want to start by thanking you for your work in this regard. Uh, in February, I led a CODEL to Jakarta to engage with ASEAN um, as an institution and with Indonesia bilaterally. There I saw firsthand the eagerness of our partners for more, not less US engagement and more beyond just our military engagement. Can you explain um, how this budget will help address the continuing need to strengthen ties with allies and partners in the Indo-Pacific region, particularly with the ASEAN nations, in order to advance our Indo-Pacific objectives? And in particular, can you highlight some key projects happening in the region in the global health and environment space? Mm -hmm. um, okay, uh, I, I guess I'd say a couple things. One, um, the, the, one of the main demand signals we are hearing from countries uh, in Southeast Asia, and this is true really uh, across the whole Indo-Pacific, but is around climate adaptation. I'm mm -hmm. sure you heard that. Indonesia is, of course, uh, we are working very closely with them on clean energy renewable projects on mitigation, on lowering their emissions since they are a substantial emitter uh, of carbon. Uh, but what we're they are really feeling the effects, and I myself was just in Vietnam, and it's very much the same way there in the Mekong Delta region and beyond, but is, you know, even rice farming now becoming, the weather patterns becoming too unpredictable, so needing to do, uh, you know, new skills training or provide new sources of livelihoods to farmers and so forth. So I think this budget request, uh, you know, and especially, again, our desire to get more discretionary money to do economic development um, uh, livelihood program, jobs programs, and so forth, much of this, the, the economic needs are growing as the effects of changing climate are r ravaging particularly rural communities, but not only the agricultural sector. So uh, that is something we are looking for uh, in this budget. We had an exchange earlier about the mandatory request, which is uh, very substantial investments. You heard uh, my exchange with, with Senator Van Hollen um, in infrastructure, but in general, just being in a position to, to scale up when a country like Indonesia really wants to elevate the partnership. Or for example, with Vietnam, we're ce celebrating 10 years of a comprehensive partnership and very eager to elevate that to a strategic partnership. Um, uh, you know, to be in a position to surge resources commensurate to that appetite. And that is what the mandatory request seeks to put us in a position to do. Uh, maybe just on global health, I, don't, I, I, I can get back to you with, with details across the ASEAN countries. Um, but Indonesia really stands out because USAID is making uh, a heightened emphasis now, or take, putting, putting much more focus on primary health investments. And Indonesia stands out you know, more, more than most countries in the world for actually moving from spending 10% of its health budget on primary care to 25%. And so we, our mission, but also working with the World Bank and others who are the big 
spenders in, in the health sector uh, in Indonesia are looking to support that effort, including through healthcare worker training, um, because so many healthcare workers, most mostly female, uh, are unpaid or, or poorly paid. And so this is a new area of emphasis for USAID. It's obviously a, a crying need uh, everywhere in the world, uh, but we have been very disease-based in focusing on TB, malaria, HIV, AIDS, all these incredibly important diseases, even global health security and pandemic prevention risks. You know, if you focus only on those those threats and, and those villains, uh, uh, and we miss out on you know the primary healthcare foundation, um, you know that would be a short-sighted investment indeed. And Indonesia is our is one of our key partners now in, in a new primary impact program. Indonesia is one that has been chosen uh, to, to partner with. Thank you. In my remaining time, I'd like to talk about um, access to clean drinking water. Uh, it's a global driver of conflict. Um, and um, in March of last year, the Biden administration pledged to provide 1.2 billion in support of the U.S. global water strategy. Can you go into some detail about how this budget addresses that commitment in 2022, and how it will help meet the growing need for consistent access to clean drinking water? Yes, I'm. I'm really excited about this actually because, again, with uh, water scarcity becoming a growing uh, challenge, um, and indeed there's a risk, um, I read the statistics in fact uh, just a few days ago, that by 2025, two-thirds of the world's population could face water scarcity. So I think you're going to see, you're, you've long, you have a long-standing interest in this, I don't hear a lot about it. Um, uh, up here, but I think that's on the verge of, of changing. And so what we have uh, asked for are $700 million uh, to support 22 priority country plans. Um, and uh, this is with an eye, again, to, to reaching 22 million more people with safe water and 22 million more people with safe sanitation, because uh, that's something that's also lacking. Um, and this is over, of course, a, a longer period of time, but, but I think that U.S. leadership in this space, given the demand signals that we are hearing, um, really can be pivotal also in galvanizing resources from other donors. Thank you. Thank you. Out of time, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Duckworth. Senator Haggerty. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, welcome, Administrator Power. Um, I'd like to talk about um, the energy policies reflected in the budget that's being proposed today. Develop, to develop economically, developing countries need reliable sources of energy. I'd like to go to a specific example, and that's Uganda. Uganda's president has said, and I quote, many developed nations are pushing an accelerated transition to renewables in Africa. This earns them praise in the US and Europe, but leaves many Africans with unreliable and expensive electricity. He goes on to say that this stands to forestall Africa's attempts to rise out of poverty, which require reliable energy. African manufacturing will struggle to attract investment and therefore to create jobs without consistent energy sources. Agriculture will suffer if the continent can't use natural gas to create synthetic fertilizer or to power efficient freight transportation. That's the end of his quote. Uh, Administrator Power, do you agree or disagree with Uganda's president? Um. Well, what I will say is that, um, you know, Power Africa, uh, our flagship energy program, as you probably know, has gotten first-time electricity to about 165 million people in Africa. So we are very much on the same page in seeking electrification, energy access, uh, particularly for the poorest. Renewables are a critical part of the solution. Um, we're not. Can we go specifically to fossil fuels. Is USAID opposed to financing fossil fuel development, as Uganda's president is talking about? Um, I, you know, I'd have to get back to you on our engagements with President Museveni's ministers. But um, my impression, actually, in Uganda, is that we've gotten very loud demand signals with regards to solar. Uh, uh, production and uh, we do have exceptions you know in our we have a preference for renewables because we do want to uh, see uh, carbon reduced but there are circumstances uh, in in which again securing rapid access uh, to clean energy in uh, l very low-income countries requires more stable uh, or, or addition, additionality. Um, I, I think that's and, exactly and, right. What, what I'm concerned about, it, Administrator, and I want to make this very clear, is that the goals that are reflected in this budget, particularly with respect to energy, 
are really missing the mark. And what it does, and I think Uganda's president articulates this well, is that it puts green colonialism over the real economic development needs of these countries. You take Uganda, for example, 30% of the population lives on $1.77 a day. These countries have been devastated by, by the pandemic. They're trying to climb out of a true economic crisis. They've got crime that's uh, rampant in many of these nations. They are trying to fulfill the most basic economic needs. And to do that, they need to have consistent, stable, reliable, and frankly, affordable energy. That's what the President of Uganda is getting at, and he's arguing that I think our policies, again, the policies touted by America, rich European nations, that in many cases discourage and, and will not support fossil fuel development are not allowing him to move along, not allowing his nation and others like it to move along a reliable pro progression. Instead, what we're trying to do is leapfrog our way into technologies that I think perhaps theologically or ideologically, again, receive plays, praise and, and, and plaudits here, but do not fill the void, do not fill the need there in developing countries like Uganda. And when we fail to do that, we create a void. And that void right now is being filled by China. And I think it was former Treasury Secretary Larry Summers who just recently talked about his discussion with the leader of a developing nation who said that when it's time to think about economic development in his country, when China shows up, they deliver an airport. When we show up, we deliver them a lecture. So my goal and my, my sincere hope is that we can get past the ideological underpinnings that are reflected in this and look at real pragmatic ways to deliver solid economic development, reliable energy, affordable energy to these countries that desperately need it. Senator, I just would love to respond. Um, in, it's, I've made clear again that we uh, support, for example, natural gas programming in instances where it can create energy access while not delaying plans toward clean energy because Again, the collective carbon emissions, even from developing countries, we're all part of the solution when it comes to mitigation. So we are working with countries, but I don't know if you've had a chance to, to travel to Uganda and engage directly, again, with uh, entrepreneurs or with farmers. Uh, but again, the idea that USAID or with USAID staff, including you know, our, our Ugandan staff, two thirds of our team, in Uganda are in fact citizens uh, of Uganda. But, but the idea that we would be putting ideology and colonialism over the development needs of the people in that country, a country we've worked in basically since independence, I just reject that premise. And I think if you, and I'm, I'd love to travel with you if you'd like to go and see up close, the demand signals that we get again from everything from government officials to civil society organizations to farmers to entrepreneurs who want to do clean energy partnerships. This is not some imposed vision by Samantha Power or Joe Biden or, or well, John Kerry. This is about actually working in partnership with the communities that we have worked in for decades. I'll ask to submit this uh, piece for the record. It's titled Solar and Wind Force Poverty on Africa, and it's written by the President of Uganda. I hope you'll take a look at this administrative power again. He makes it very clear that he needs help today with reliable and affordable energy, not some aspirational goals that we're not supporting. Well, I hope you'll allow us to provide you as well, or maybe we can put in the record Uganda's own nationally determined contribution to the Paris Agreement, which is its plan for curbing emissions, because that's actually the government's plan, irrespective of what President Museveni, who says a lot of things, may have said in, in any particular speech. We, we, we are working with them on the implementation of their plan. Well, I hate to see us put carbon emission reduction over the actual needs to fulfill the, the rising from poverty that we're trying to accomplish here. But I, I hope you will agree that USAID cares an awful lot about helping people lift, lift people out of poverty and that we've demonstrated that uh, over, over many decades. I want to assure countries. that we continue to do so. And we that, will continue to do that so. That USAID's goals is to basically win friends and bring about uh, people into our fold as opposed to pushing them into the arms of China, which and, seems to and be And I happening. want to assure both of you that the record is replete with your views. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Without objection, Senator Haggerty's request shall be, uh, uh, document shall be included in the record. Senator Paul has come back. He has another question, and I'm happy to recognize him at this time. Will you be testifying, Ms. Powers, to uh, Homeland Security over your budget as you've done today to USAID? Uh, no. 
You mentioned that the records that I've requested from the PREDICT program that is part of USAID concerning coronavirus research that you gave them to the Committee of Jurisdiction. If you're not testifying before Homeland Security and you're sitting here today before the Foreign Relations Committee, I would wonder why the Foreign Relations Committee wouldn't be the Committee of Jurisdiction. Thank you. Senator Kane made a similar point, and so uh, let me just, I guess, clarify, but USAID has provided hundreds of documents to, to both to both SFRC and, uh, and the Homeland Security Government so Affairs you're Committee. saying that all the documents that I want from the PREDICT program you've already given to Senator Menendez? I can't, I know you're asking for a range of things. There are some that we're not. Senator Menendez, are you aware of having documents on the coronavirus research that I'm interested in? Uh, well, I'm happy to let you ask questions of the witness. Uh, I don't intend to be put under. Uh, no, I don't mean process. to be critical. I just I'm, don't no, think I'm, I'm going to respond I mean, to you uh, in my own yeah, time. Yeah, but I mean, I don't think he does because I've been requesting this. And, you know, if his staff does have all this information, you'd think somebody would be forthcoming with saying, oh, we've already got all this. I don't think what you're saying is, is honest. And so my question is, you say you've given it to Senate Foreign Relations, and you say you've also given it to Homeland Security. To whom, with those committees, have you given this information? I, I have not personally handed over Somebody the information it. myself, but, but we will absolutely get to back to your staff to, to ascertain exactly Did you give that exactly to the chairman the of this committee? Are? Did you give it to the chairman of Homeland Security? You don't know if the correspondence was with the chairman or if it was with someone else. I would presume it would have to be through the chairman. What, what I know is that we have provided hundreds of documents okay, to the Senate Foreign Relations not worried about, I apologize for not saying that earlier. My, my question is not just about committee. hundreds of documents. My question is about coronavirus research that USAID has funded. Oh, sorry. In yes, China. I mean on the Predict program specifically. On the Predict I don't mean program, on the, on the Predict the program, but specifically yeah. on coronavirus research either granted or denied. Some of the most important information we have is actually a DARPA grant where Wuhan Institute of Virology asked for money to create a virus that looks like what COVID became. We didn't fund it, but it shows that they were already interested in creating a virus similar to what COVID-19 is. So we wanna know, did the PREDICT program give grant proposals for the creation of viruses that were similar to COVID-19 or, or that might've become COVID-19? And we also wanna know if, um, you know, you denied any of these programs. It's important to us to know if they were asking for other money from you to do research that could have become COVID-19. But what I've gotten from you is not an answer. You're saying, oh, somebody else has all this information and we'll pursue it, but then you'll be gone. And then in six months time, we'll come back and say, well, we asked the chairman of this committee and that committee, they don't have it. The thing is, is it makes us all suspicious you won't give it to me. Or you're going to give it to somebody else. You're going to give it to a Democrat chairman, but not to someone from the minority party. So this is all very unfortunate, and it, it, it makes us concerned about the transparency of your administration. Senator Paul, if I may. Uh, first of all, uh, it's not the question of the Democratic chairman. The question is, is the procedures historically have been that upon requests uh, or when documents are provided, they're provided to the chair of the committee, regardless of who the chair that is at any given time. When Senator Risch was the chair, it would have been the same thing. However, uh, since you, you first raised this earlier today, my staff informs me that USAID has, in fact, provided a number of documents related to your area of interest on COVID. And I'm happy to work to facilitate a review of those documents with you. My understanding is uh, at a staff level, we have been discussing with Senator Risch's staff how to make those available to you. There are likely thousands of documents uh, and we are working to set up a system so they can be viewed uh, electronically in camera, which we believe is a workable uh, set of circumstances. So, um, so I'm happy to follow up and make sure that we come to a conclusion on that. Uh, thank you very much. The, the only problem with not being able to actually hold the documents, print them out, and, and write on the documents is it, it's very limiting, as you know, for, for me to sit in, in your office and read them. I mean, none of these are classified. If there's anything in there that reveals some spy's name somewhere, which I don't know how that would be in a science no. grant. I, you, you I'm, know, I'm not suggesting that them. you have to read them. I'm sure that uh, uh, we could have your staff read them on your behalf and give you an executive summary. Uh, but we'll work to see if we can come up to an accommodation. There, the question here is a more precedent-setting one, uh, and it has not been 
the role of the committee that when the chair and or ranking member request documents to then just hand those documents over to members of the committee. It has always been that it's been kept in a process that then can be reviewed when the chair and or ranking member decide to do so. So it's a bigger question than your specific uh, interest. But it's but also I'm, taken this exchange for me to even discover you have the, the doc, some of the documents. I still don't no, know I, if you I have just, all of them I, that we've requested. I, I don't know that I have all of them that you want. I have no idea of the universe, the totality of the universe, but whatever we have been given, we're happy to, uh, now that we, I know that we have been given documents, we're happy to find a way for you to review them and see if that hopefully satisfies your curiosity. Um, Senator Cruz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Administrator Power, welcome. Good to see you again. It's no secret that I've been deeply concerned with the direction of the Biden administration's foreign policy, and you and I have had many discussions in this area. I would hope, though, that we both agree that, that first, USAID has a valuable role to play regarding development assistance, and second, that USAID's mission should remain separate from controversial debates that often divide other parts of the State Department. One of the controversies has been the Biden administration's deliberate, systemic, and reckless appeasement of terrorist groups everywhere from the Western Hemisphere to the Middle East. From day one, the administration has removed the terrorist designation and provided resources to Iranian-linked terrorist groups around Israel's border, including pouring money into Hamas-controlled territory. In the Western Hemisphere, they did the same thing with the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia, the FARC, which provided enormous and dangerous momentum to anti-American movements across the hemisphere. Now, we can disagree about the wisdom of those decisions. But I would have hoped we would have agreed that USAID shouldn't be entangled in these deeply divisive decisions. And so I guess what, what I would ask, let's, let's start by talking about Colombia and the FARC. Why is it that USAID actively participated and supported the revocation of the terrorist and narcotics related designation of the FARC? Um, I'm, I'm, I would have to get back to you. I'm not aware of the process and deliberations that you're talking about. Okay, well, l l let me help you on that. On January 24th, 2022, there was a decision memo in USAID. The USAID, the subject is request for concurrence to modify USAID programming following revocation of the terrorist and narcotics related designations of the FARC. You signed that memo. You approved that shift, the memo explicitly embraces modifying USAID programming to enhance our support in light of the revocation of terrorist and narcotics related designation of the FARC. Why is USAID getting in the middle of that? Well, let me say what we're in the middle of in Colombia. Um, we're in the middle of trying to support the peace process, uh, the peace process that culminated in a peace, but the implementation of a peace. And we have worked for decades in the most underdeveloped areas from which the FARC recruited over so many years in agriculture, in livelihood support, and transitioning people away from, uh, you know, growing things that are not in anybody's interest for them to be growing. Um, and so I, I, I apologize for not being able to, to recall this particular piece of paper that, you, that you're describing, especially if my signature is on it. That's, uh, I'll get back to you on that. But on the, on the general thrust of our programming on the ground in Colombia, we do work in trying to ensure that soldiers who've gone back to their communities have an alternative source of livelihood so they don't pick up guns again. So I, I suspect that that is, in general, the, the logic of of the adjustment to be able to do that. Well, I will say the Biden administration's decision to embrace the FARC was a huge blow to Ivan Duque's government, which was pro-America, which was a strong ally. And the pattern we've seen from the Biden administration is they actively undermine strong allies, particularly in Latin America. And the result is, congratulations to the Biden administration, 
they pushed and ended up getting a, the first Marxist president in power in Colombia, who is explicitly anti-American, Gustavo Petro. And by the way, Biden's managed to do the same thing in Brazil. Uh, over and over again, the Biden administration is hurting U.S. national security interest because ideology is a higher priority. Let's shift to another part of the, the world, the Middle East, the Gaza Strip. USAID pours resources into the Gaza Strip. And usually USAID lists its grants for public scrutiny and disclosure. Last year, a mysterious $10 million grant appeared on the website. It was for $10 million. It had no recipient, and it was listed as going to the West Bank. After my office began investigating what this was, your office let us know that every detail of that was wrong, that the millions were actually not sent to the West Bank, they were sent to the Gaza Strip, the amount was wrong, it was $5 million and not $10 million, and that the organization should have been listed, but it's an organization that only works in the Gaza Strip, so if it had been listed, it would have been obvious that it was going to the Gaza Strip and, and the public designation was wrong. Did you launch an investigation as to why that public disclosure was so wildly wrong, every aspect of it was less than forthcoming and accurate about what USAID was doing in, in the Gaza Strip? I, I will, going forward, uh, look into those discrepancies. Uh, that is unusual. Uh, something like that has not been brought to my attention before. You know, something that goes out publicly claiming one thing about a grant recipient when something else entirely is true. So I will absolutely look into it. Thank you. Well, and I appreciate the follow-up of the results of your investigation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just a couple of final questions, Madam Administrator. Um, do, we, do you have any effort to get other countries in the world uh, that uh, are like-minded, share our values, in which we can join together in an effort to create a force multiplier in our development assistance globally. You know, I think about what China does, and I think about if uh, many of our friends in Western Europe, Canada, Korea, and elsewhere were to engage in development assistance in a coordinated fashion, we would have a force multiplier that would equal to or surpass. Is that something that is uh, at all being uh, thought about in, in your operation? I mean, it's, it's our uh, daily... Um I don't know, obsession is probably too strong, but if we can't multilateralize what we do, we can't keep up, right? Not, not only with the PRC, but with the needs in the communities in which we work. So we have MOUs that we've signed just in the last few years with Japan, with the Republic of Korea. I just did a, a kind of sub-MOU uh, last week or the week before with the United Kingdom on education specifically about how we leverage what we're doing in order to get the UK, to, which is cutting back assistance in so many sectors, but to get them uh, at least to hold steady or, or potentially to increase in that sector. Um, I know Ukraine is not really the focus of your, of your question, but I, I do think it's noteworthy that a country like Norway uh, has committed 1.7% of its GDP to Ukraine funding, and that's everything from humanitarian assistance to core development funding in terms of governance institutions. I, you know, I can get you a rundown of, of where uh, we are capitalizing on this. We just launched a partnership with, with Ireland, which has provided $50 million on um, ready-to-use therapeutic feeding to prevent wasting in children. I, I'd, I'd and I mean, that's a, a country it. of a tiny population, but that is stepping up again in a specific sector. I'd I think appreciate what's, seeing it, because, and yeah. I appreciate some of the examples. My, in my mind, the question is more of a holistic, coordinated approach versus a series of one-offs. Can we ultimately engage in a joint compact in which we can leverage our collective assistance in a way that we will do the good that we seek to do on the USAID, but I, create a false multiple? Yeah, I th I, what I would say is the OECD and the DAC, there's a development assistance committee that is exactly, I think, what you're describing, but every country has its own politics just as we do and its own members of parliament, let's say, who have their own specific development uh, uh, agenda, maybe, or, or a specific line of effort that they want to see pursued. So 
what it does, what the DAC does is I think finds synergies, but I think fundamentally we, we so far have found it more productive to work bilaterally and particularly in the field uh, because that is where we identify where the greatest needs are or where we can reinforce well, one I'll follow up with you. Um, okay, I that's recently, a great question. I recently traveled to South Africa where the United States is doing some incredible development and humanitarian work. But my sense is that despite our success and people's perceptions, still seems to be that China is the better partner for growth. Um, this is bigger uh, than just branding and slapping uh, flags and logos on boxes, books, and plaques. This is about having a comprehensive strategic community outreach plan that reaches the masses. So what is USAID doing to ensure the general populations of beneficiary communities not only see USAID's presence, but feel and understand how they benefit from USAID's work? Um, well, as you know, we are very attentive uh, to branding, but I agree with you that slapping a logo uh, on, a, on a, you know, a, a, sh a shelter that's been uh, built or a, a school that's been built uh, is not the same as communications. I, look, I think we are, as part of our new policy framework, which we put out uh, about six weeks ago, we have, for the first time, a dedicated reform effort on communications, because I think it's not only the PRC's large loans and the infrastructure that has yielded, uh, and that is a backdrop for our assistance and where our grants, because there's China does nine to one loan to grant, we do nine to one grant to loan as a government in foreign assistance, but it's also in the disinformation environment we operate in. I think, frankly, we have a long way to go in knowing, you know, how to uh, project what we are actually doing in communities over the noise of false claims about what USAID or what the U.S. government as a whole is doing. Um, we are we are not terribly well resourced in this domain. I think we did over the decades get used to you know, uh, the, the programs kind of, and the projects speaking for themselves, the impacts speaking for themselves. Anybody who's been touched by a USAID program, certainly in my experience, has never forgotten it. Um, but we're diff operating in a very different uh, information ecosystem now, and I think you're absolutely right that between disinformation and PRC kind of large yep. infrastructure investments, well, we'd love we have work, our work cut out for we'd us. We'd love to work with you to uh, either resource and or help, you know, it, the American people are very generous uh, with their money, but would like at the end of the day that the beneficiaries say, the United States of America did this for me. Uh, and having that, I think, is a critical part of the ability to continue to find the support in Congress for that. If we can make that correlation, which I believe exists, but doesn't necessarily get realized by the beneficiaries, uh, I think it would have, as part of our overall public diplomacy, it would be an important factor. So I would like to work with you on that. Um, I want to turn to food insecurity for a moment. Um, due to limited USAID resources, the World Food Program is cutting food rations in refugee camps worldwide. Meanwhile, food insecurity is continuing to rise while people flee from violence in places like the Sahel, Sudan, Burma. Devastating choices are being made whose consequences will be borne by the world's most vulnerable people. How uh, is USAID weighing and uh, planning to deal with these competing food assistance needs to respond in differing contexts equitably and effectively? Um, let me just say it's an impossible task. There's no other way around it. Um, we, this year, will literally be debating you know, where rations get cut altogether, where they get cut in half. Um, you know, with the outbreak of violence in Sudan, you know, you're both horrified and, and, and heartbroken for the people of Sudan, and then you immediately think as well of all the people in other countries, like the Horn of Africa, Somalia, um, uh, who, because of these new needs, you know, those resources inevitably will be, will be scaled back. So the only answer, I, I, we can brief you on what our methodology is. It's a very sophisticated methodology, which, you know, takes UN appeals, including from the WFP as a baseline, and then looks at, 
issues of access and, um, but again, vulnerability and, and the greatest need is, is the driver. Um, but, but, you know, fundamentally, we are going to reach far fewer people with far less this year because last year, through the Ukraine supplementals, you all were generous enough and far-sighted enough to write those supplementals in the broadest terms, mm -hmm. allowing us flexibility to use the humanitarian assistance in those supplementals in countries that were affected by Putin's war in Ukraine. And because, you know, the Horn of Africa, Somalia gets 95% of its wheat from Ukraine and Russia, for example, we were able then to draw on those supplemental resources. Uh, this year is, is just going to be excruciating. Yeah, well, we'd love to see the, um, how you come to those decisions. And, and do you think we're treating food beneficiaries equally in the global south as we are elsewhere? Could, could you elaborate on the question? Yeah, so I, I mean, are, are, are we treating uh, those in the global south the same that we are treating elsewhere as we deal with the question of how, who do we feed how, and how do we succeed at feeding them? I mean, we, we, we mainly operate in the global south, so I'm not sure. Do, do you mean across countries right. within the global south? Right. I mean, I think, again, the the primary first factor is this question of vulnerability. Um, and um, so, you know, if you are in what's called IPC5, you know, facing almost famine levels of food insecurity, that is going to be our first port of call, but not if access is obstructed or if we have a government who's an unwilling partner in providing that uh, assistance. So if, if I understand your question again, it's, it's, it's need-based, but that's only part of the answer because we can't meet all the Are we treating the global the south needs. the same way we are treating Ukraine? Oh, that's what you mean. Okay, sorry. I, oh, I, didn't, I didn't hear your reference to Ukraine. Well, I think the, the Congress has, again, provided very, very substantial resources to deal with Ukraine because of the massive carnage and the massive geopolitical uh, stakes of that conflict. And so if you're asking per capita if a Ukrainian refugee is receiving more in Europe uh, than a South Sudanese refugee in Uganda, the answer is yes, they are receiving more uh, in Europe. Um, but again, my objective would be to see everybody <laughs> properly sheltered, properly cared for, properly schooled when they become a refugee. Um, and we are grateful, uh, again, to Europe, both for providing substantial assistance so when in we Ukraine have, and, just, just, to, uh, yeah. just to put a fine point on it. So when we have millions, you know, we talk about the millions of refugees that have fled Ukraine, and of course we should respond to that and be as helpful as we can. But we have had nearly five million Venezuelans flee Venezuela. And we've provided $1.8 billion in humanitarian assistance and, to Venezuelans who have fled, and I, thanks and to you I, all. And I would look at that in comparison to what we've done with Ukraine, and what would that number be? Okay. Okay. Uh, <laughs> democracy and, and governance, final question. You recently wrote in Foreign Affairs that we have to, quote, look at our all economic programming that respects democratic norms as a form of democratic assistance. That's, that's the quote. Economic assistance certainly is popular with governments and it can help us move the needle on some things like labor protections and good governance, but it makes a very small percentage of USAID's programming. So how are we, you know, I, I am increasingly concerned that USAID moves away from its democracy, human rights, and governance part of its uh, mission. And when I hear economic assistance is going to be the essence of how we are looking at democracy assistance, and I see it's such a small percentage of USAID's program, it means we're not going to do much on democracy, human rights, uh, and rule of law. So tell me why I'm wrong, because I see you're shaking your I mean, head. Well, yes, I'd love to have a longer conversation with you, a deep dive on our expanded uh, democracy uh, assistance programming. It's everything from greater protections from uh, and insurance for journalists who are and civil society organizations that are coming under attack uh, to greater transparency on in extractive industries um, to you know ne the need again to, to to fund programming that can bring about a digital and open internet in countries that are backsliding and moving uh, in the wrong direction 
it's, and it's election assistance and, and so much of the assistance that we know well from, from decades of seeing democracy assistance. What's new is the recognition that when there is a reform or, or the, the application of the recognition that when there is a reform opening in a country where a leader is doing hard things, bucking the anti-democratic trends globally, we are trying to see in our very slender sort of discretionary uh, program area whether there is some way, uh, for example, to um, you know, create a private sector partnership where farmers will see low interest loans with a local bank more readily available, um, where you know, when a leader like the president of Zambia is uh, doing away with a defamation law, but the economic headwinds are intense, is there like a little plus up in our programming there in food security, given the fertilizer shortage that we can mobilize? Again, our core democracy programming remains broadly familiar, but the fact that we are not doing economic development programming, despite being a development agency at scale, in the way that I firmly believe we should be, um, means that uh, we we go looking. We have to go looking into you know pre-existing pots, you know, like an agricultural pot, or you know maybe there'd be a vaccine delivery that could occur in a high-profile way with a leader, again, who's doing hard things in the political domain. But the point here is goes well beyond what USAID is doing. It can also be about high-level visits. It can be about encouraging tourism to to places where. Uh, again, pro-democratic things are happening, but I think if you look back over the last 20 years of democratic backsliding or 17 years of democratic backsliding, you see, I think we can all agree we paid insufficient attention to those reform openings that occurred, mm -hmm. and if we can now do a better job flooding the zone and trying to be responsive to the needs of civil society or leaders who are doing hard things, I think then we have a better chance of supporting them yeah. uh, implementing well, the, their reform you know, agenda. The, 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 the slide in democratic backsliding is particularly relevant in the Western Hemisphere, in our own front yard. Well, sadly, it's uh, relevant and, uh, globally. But, and yeah. uh, whereas one time there was only one country in the hemisphere that was few, uh, totally um, uh, totalitarian dictatorship, which was Cuba. Now you have Venezuela, you have Nicaragua, uh, you have Cuba continuing, and you have others moving in the wrong direction. And so uh, when I see people like President Lasso of Ecuador, who is fully committed to a democratic agenda aligned with American values, aligned with American issues, it seems to me that countries like that uh, need to have the, the aid of the United States so that when you follow those values and you share them and you actually not just say it, but you implement them, that then there is a response by the United States that sends a message not only to that government that you're doing the right thing and we're your partner, but sends a message to others in the hemisphere that when you act in a way that is in pursuit of democracy, rule of law, and human rights, there is a benefit. And I, I, I just think that there is a disconnect between that reality uh, and, um, and the desire of achieving that and the reality of what we do. And, um, you know, if it's a question of resources, we should talk about it because um, uh, we are badly beaten in the Western Hemisphere, I can tell you that right now. I just finished a four-country tour uh, in the recess. Before that, I was down there again. We are badly beaten in the Western Hemisphere, and our allies are under siege. And we don't seem to be able to be nimble enough to deal in ways to help our allies and send a message within the hemisphere that when you are aligned with us in terms of values and you execute on them, we're there. So uh, more uh, for maybe a longer conversation than this hearing. Uh, the record for this hearing will remain open until the close of business on Friday, April 28th. Oh, I'm sorry. No, 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 uh, 2023. Please ensure that questions for the record are submitted no later than next Wednesday. S Senator Rich, thank you. Administrator Power with the thanks